for another Astro Babble. Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yes, got to put on a happy face. Got to got to do your makeup, get things going. Um, so we are about to get going. We got eight more charts here, and I'm about to talk about the stars to your face. Uh, we've got eight different birth dates, places, and times that you all have lovingly submitted. Uh, and we are going to talk about what I see, just cold reading the charts. I've plugged them into my uh, solar fire software. And um, we're just going to kind of chat about chat about what it's like to, to read somebody's astrology chart. Hopefully give you all some insights, give you all some insights. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what we do. If you would like to be a part of the queue. Um, just submit your birth date, place, and time via private message to moi. We will add you to that queue. And if you'd like to schedule a private consult at all um, or check out some of my online classes, just go to scorpiorisingastrology.com. All righty. Let's go ahead and talk about Demetria for two seconds, um, longer than two seconds. Uh, but we're going to talk about Demetria's chart. So Demetria was born 8.40 a.m. in Allentown. Let's go ahead and go ahead and look at that, shall we? Okay, so we've got a Capricorn ascendant, and then we've got Neptune and Venus and Capricorn in the first. So this, this to me does speak towards a, uh, a repressed mystical tendency in the chart. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, we have a lot of repression in the chart, just overall. But the idea that Neptune, this outer planet that tends to make things muddy, confused, sleepy, um, but also it's a planet of escapism on the lower levels of expression. It tends to be this planet that forces us to uh, escape into other worlds, fantasy or otherwise. Venus is that planet of love and affection and adoration and um, abundance, but both this Neptunian whimsical nature and this lovely Venus are in the restrictive cardinal earth sign of Capricorn, where they are hyper-focused on getting things done over the long haul, they're more success-oriented, and they don't have time for the little things that, frankly, Neptune and Venus really enjoy talking about. So I think there's a contradiction here in Demetria's chart where there's a lot of loveliness to be had, but whether or not she allows herself to experience and smell the roses is another story because we have Saturn, the Lord of the chart in Sagittarius in the 12th house of hidden enemies, as well as the sun in Sagittarius, Mercury, Sagittarius, Uranus in Sagittarius in the 12th house of enemies. When the sun and the chart ruler are in that 12th house, we've locked away a lot of our personal power. We've locked away a lot of what makes us us. We've locked away a lot of the radiant potential of the sun, which grants us things like self-esteem. But then we've also locked away uh, the, the essence of who we are via putting that Lord of the chart into the 12th house where it cannot be seen by the ascendant is a good way to say it. Yes. So that's that's just something that we need to address with Demetria's chart. We would need to surround her with people, places, things who are very affirming to her life, her personality, her strengths, um, and all that jazz. And I think one of the ways that we access and pull out some of these these uh, these afflicted planets or these planets who are not in a very good position is via this moon in Leo. Now the moon in Leo is up in the eighth house of death, taxes, estates, and business. So one of the things that I would encourage Demetria to do would be to get a side hustle for sure. That will activate the Leo potential of her moon, get her emotions to be a little bit more fiery, which will uh, get or what we'd call remediate that self-esteem issue of locking your son away in the in the 12th house. So that's that's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to recharge around family. Uh, because we have this North Node in Pisces in the third being ruled by Jupiter in Aries in the fourth. Although Jupiter in Aries is retrograde, there's this there's this almost overly encouraging energy in the home life. Um, and even if even if parents or siblings aren't necessarily encouraging outwardly, the friction or the energy, the grandioseness of that family does encourage you to create new avenues of connection, to, to build more bridges. It does allow you to find some synastry in the chart where previously, you know, a lot of your fire signs are in that 
um, a lot of your fiery energy uh, of that Sagittarius stellium is in a place that you can't really access it. So the way that we access it is by, again, going out on your own through the eighth house of business, but also things like um, investigating or being close to people who have died or are dying, especially because that that is an area that you would succeed in professionally uh, with hospice care, mortician work, things of that nature. Um, yes but we recharge around family business, family business. Those are the two Those are the two ways that we can really unlock a lot of potential in the chart. The one thing that I'd like to just like really pointedly drive home about Demetra's chart is we have this south node in Virgo being ruled by Mercury and Sag in the 12th. And basically what that's astrobabble for is when, when Demetra is doubting herself, the one thing that she falls back on is this idea of travel, higher education and foreigners and foreign culture and spirituality to a certain extent. You do not need another book, honey. You just need to pivot your life in a way that gives you more meaning, yeah? You have everything that you need, all the skills that you need, totally present. Don't think that you don't have enough because you are, you're, you're a complete package. However, this package, when those self-esteem issues start to claw up really, really fiercely, it means that you're going in the wrong direction. So you don't need to learn something. You don't need to think that you're lesser than, you don't need to go take another class. You just need to be surrounded by the right influences because you are just veering off track. We need to install the bumper rails to make sure that you're not going down that south node path of the Virgo ninth, um, the Virgo south node ninth house stuff. So that's, that would be my two cents for Demetria's chart. Um, let me know what you think about that, Demetria. But I think that's pretty much it because we've got that stellium and that's that's all good stuff. Yes. Uh, good morning, Jennifer, Albert, Bradley, uh, Melina, everybody who's jumping on, Lisa, who just commented. Um, uh, Catherine Carter, thank you so much. Everybody, uh, Instagram, Facebook, salute to you. Cheering with LaCroix. Uh, okay. This is Key Lime Pie LaCroix. From being from Florida, this this does it just fine, honey. Okay, let's talk about Octavia's chart. Octavia's number two out of eight in the list. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Girl, what are we gonna do about you? Oh Lord. Okay, so we've got this ascendant at zero degrees. Zero degrees. We need to be very, very specific about this birth time. I know we have 509, which is always helpful whenever I see like a nine or an 07 or like a 32. I always enjoy seeing that as opposed to like, I was born at noon. I was born at 430. Chances are you were not born on an even number um, unless you were really, really specific, but I digress. So we have this, this Libra ascendant, which naturally brings a lot of beauty into the chart. There's this when I, when I talk to my clients about having a Libra ascendant, there's almost this veil of Venusian beauty uh, that people have to break through in order to get to your real personality, uh, which can can be really, really charismatic and really, really lovely. I enjoy, um, I enjoy seeing a Libra ascendant, especially with the moon in Libra here. So we have a double Libra uh, energy that Octavia has. Again, we talked about this yesterday a little bit, but when we have the ascendant, the moon, or the sun, when two of those are in the same sign, they are a double that. Um, and that could be any combination of the of the three. When somebody has three, uh, all three of those in the same sign, then they're considered a triple, whatever that is, uh, which just means that they have more of that energy in the chart. So we have a double down on the Libra. Uh, we would call you a little bit of a super Libra if, if, and there's a big if, um, and that's one of the reasons why you should read for Libra, not just Scorpio. Although we have Mercury and Scorpio in Kazemi with the sun at one degree of Scorpio, plus Venus at 19 degrees of Scorpio and South Node all in the second house of finance. Crazy town. Absolutely crazy town. So we have the ruler of the chart in the second house of finance. This tells us that money is going to be a very important part of the life. Is it going to be an easy part of the life? No, because Mercury is, or because Venus is here in Scorpio, Venus hates to be in Scorpio. She is in her fall in Scorpio. She's opposing her natural rulership in Taurus. Therefore, she is what we would call in detriment. Um, not detriment, but in detriment. Yeah, y'all don't know these terms. It's okay. I love you anyway. Um, but that Mer that Venus is also very close to the south node. South node in the chart is the energy suck. 
it really is not where we're moving towards. It's it's something that we find a little bit too comfortable. Uh, and so when we find especially Mercury and the Sun in Kazemi here in the second house, that adds a lot of very interesting power to the financial dynamic in Octavia's chart. Um, there's just so much money stuff that Octavia is going to have coming in. Not all of it's going to be positive. Uh, there may be a very strained relationship with money because the ruler of the chart is here in detriment. Um, but this Kazemi with Mercury is going to bring massive amounts of financial intelligence. There's going to be an appreciation, a awareness of wealth and value. Like I can see her at two years old, like looking at diamonds through one of those like lensy thingies and being able to to count the carrots like that that stuff she she just has that knack that eye for beauty um but at the same time it is a part of the chart that we want her to steer away from even though there is a lot of power here there's a lot of self-development here this is not where she needs to be instead we need to move it to the eighth house that eighth house of business of entrepreneurship of taxes estates of death we're moving in that direction because Octavia needs to move from that that idea of I can identify wealth, wealth is all around me, to how do I turn how do I turn this into an investment? How do I turn this into not just owning wealth, but making money have babies, making money work for me instead of me working for money? This is going to be the the lifelong question of Octavia's chart: is how do I how do I use this value that I've accrued and put it to work? Yes. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, there are multiple markers for estate work in the chart, which is really, really interesting um, because we have Mars and Pisces in the sixth being ruled by Jupiter and Virgo in the 12th. I'm actually a fan of that axis uh, because Jupiter brings out the, the efficiency of Virgo and allows Virgo to process things on a mass scale, whereas Mars gets gets technically not okayed, but technically doused by Pisces and embraces a little bit more of that spiritual quality. I think the two of those on this axis in Octavia's chart on the 6th and the 12th really talk about working with death very well, working in the health professions, um, and especially with people who are in transition financially, uh, working in a hospital setting would be very, very good in a management or a finance role. Um, especially because that that Mercury and Scorpio rules that ninth of travel, foreigners, higher education, going to school for finance would be a very, very smart move for Octavia's chart. Uh, I think that that would just be a bomb way to, to really get some cool stuff uh, moving in the chart. The one thing that the one thing that I think is a little bit tricky about the chart is we have this MC in Cancer, uh, this Midheaven in Cancer, this uh, Saturn and Cancer as well, up in the 10th house of success. And that's making sign base square, but also in the midheaven at one degree is making an exact square to the ascendant at zero in, um, in Libra. They're only uh, like less than 10 seconds apart. So when we look at when we look at this, I think one of the things that Octavia is going to struggle with as well is she's so good at what she does but the fame aspect and the notoriety really cause her to pause and, and roll backwards. And there's this idea of, oh, well, if I get too famous or if I get too well known, then my whole life plan falls apart and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be quote unquote a success because I'm compromising who I am. And that's, that's really not necessarily true um, but it's going to feel like it's true, which is going to be really, really tough to overcome. But the idea of success coming because of easy things like her beauty, uh, easy things like her natural charisma, as opposed to her hidden talents, really going to peeve her off. Um, for not being recognized or valued. But again, she has so much Scorpio in her chart. She has the ability to see things that others don't on a deeper level. So getting frustrated at that just because people are inept, Scorpio language, sorry, very fierce, but very correct. Um, that's that's not her problem. Um, and she shouldn't refuse the, the golden success of the 10th house just because other people are putting her in positions of power without knowing the full story because they will never know the full story because Scorpios are secretive by nature, Octavia. Get used to it. You will be hidden, child. Um, and that's just, that's part of the, part of the deal, sweetheart. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, awesome. 
Cool. Oh, and you're going to be working with your spouse long term because we have a connection between Mars in the sixth and uh, in Aries ruled seventh. So the idea that you would meet your spouse at work and or you would be working in your spouse's business. Um, that's definitely going to be a thing moving forward. Cool. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for jumping on. Anthony, lovely to see you. Liz, fantastic. Uh, thank you, everybody who's jumping on Facebook and Instagram. We're just going through eight charts. Good morning. Good morning. Love you so much. All the kisses in the world. Uh, we're on chart number three. Let's look at Ziva. Ziva was born at 5.15 p.m. in Sheffield. We've got a Gemini ascendant at three degrees being ruled by Mercury and Libra in the fifth. Oh, I like that. I like that, Ziva. So the Ascendant in Gemini gives us an air kick right off the bat. Communicative, intelligent, talkative, um, loves to investigate the mental extremes. Yeah, that's Gemini in a handbasket. Then we have the ruler of the chart, Mercury, uh, in the fifth house of creativity, of children, of sexuality, of um, parenting, and that Mercury is in Libra, another air sign, which is absolutely flawless. Um, I enjoy Mercury being an air signs, period. So we have an air rulership on the ascendant, the Lord planet in the fifth house of creativity in an air sign. We're off to a great start with Ziva's chart. Really, really enjoying it. Um, however, you're not going to be able to shut this <laughs> this little one up. You're just, you're just not. She's going to be talkative. She's going to be expressive. Um, but she's going to do it in a very beautiful way. And I think that one of the things that uh, you'll really be able to nourish in this chart, Ziva, is your sense of creativity because it is where your chart ruler is at, um, but also an over-identification with being a parent um, and really focusing on the idea of I will not be complete until I have baby. Uh, that is that is something that a, a ruler in the fifth also will create because fifth house is creativity on a metaphysical level. Yeah, we have all of this Mercury and Libra beauty, like your attention to symmetry and shapes and light and feng shui and art, you know, all of that is so present in, in the chart. But, and this is how I know I'm on track because I'm rhyming and sounding like Dr. Seuss. Um, it's a thing. Don't judge me. So when we look at the, the Mercury and Libra being in that fifth house, fifth house is also children. The Lord of your chart being in the fifth house, there's this attachment, this identification, this I am where the chart ruler is, ness about you needing to have children to feel complete as a person. Not correct, but it's just it's just how you've chosen to, to write your makeup this time around. We do have this really interesting pile up in the fourth house of family though, which again confirms the idea of so much needing to happen in the family and children's space. Um, which is also being ruled by the ruler of your chart, Mercury, which is another reason why you over-identify with children, Ziva. So we have South Node in Virgo, Saturn in Virgo, Moon in Virgo, as well as Our Lady Venus in Virgo. So Venus in Virgo and Mercury in Libra, they're in what we would call mutual reception. They are changing signs, which means that there's even more connection between the Lord of the chart, Mercury in the fifth house of children, and Venus in Virgo in the fourth house of family. So again, the, I, there's just so much about children, so much about family in Ziva's chart. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, I'm really enjoying this, this archetype. It's very, not, not in a creepy way, but it's very Stepford wife, but not like not like in a restrictive psycho, psycho, dark, twisted thriller way. It's literally Ziva's chart is dressing in that 50s style with the really big prump, plump red lipstick and, and going out to water the plants and waving to the neighbors and everything is absolutely pristine and everything revolves around the white picket fence and the family dynamic in Ziva's chart. That is so correct for Ziva. Um, interjecting her into that time would, would be a thing. So that's that's definitely the archetype that I see a lot, the 50s the 50s housewife with Venus and Virgo in the fourth. It's that it's that maternal energy that but that maternal energy is so pristine, so clean, so sterile would be a good way to say it, uh, that it really hampers down a lot of the love and affection that can be given. It's almost a robotic love. Uh, that comes forward. But the Mercury the um, the Mercury in Libra does, I think, counterbalance that. And the moon in Virgo does bring just a little bit of pickiness to the 
to the equation. I think there was an influence of strictness growing up with Ziva. Uh, that strictness is really what formed and molded a lot of the a lot of the Virgo concepts that we're starting to see in the chart. Uh, but that south node of Virgo is really the opposite of where Ziva is going. So although family is the crutch, although family is the mold, um, we're actually going to be needing to move into a different part of the chart. Uh, speaking of which, we have Jupiter and Sagittarius in the seventh house. Great, um, absolutely fabulous, fabulous planet to have in the seventh house because it's the relationship house. And what do we all want? A rich husband, a rich husband. Um, and that's what Jupiter and Sagittarius grants us in the seventh house. Um, and I say husband jokingly, but rich spouse in general. Um, there are no there are no, especially with Mercury ruling the fifth, we don't know what the sexuality will be. In Libra, the sign of indecision. I mean, come on. Um, when we look at that Jupiter and Sagittarius in the seventh as a major good luck marker for, for relationships in general, uh, it's it's just a good sign. We do have Pluto and Sag here, so there is a chance that Ziva will have a, a widowing experience halfway through the life and potentially remarry. Uh, that is something that I see a lot with, with Pluto being in the seventh house, a spouse passing away uh, and or uh, marrying halfway through the life for some reason. Yes, uh, and that Jupiter is ruling the North Node in the 10th house. And we also have um, that North Node in Pisces. We also have that uh, Uranus in Pisces retrograde in the tenth house. And I think that there's a, I think that there's an interesting pivot here because it talks about bringing the relationship in the seventh house to success, or associating that seventh house, especially with that Jupiter and Sag, with success. And that could be little things like um, supporting a spouse who is very successful um, or being that that housekeeper, that housewife, again, with all that family tendencies, that stay at home parent uh, that's really able to take care of the home and hold that down, staple that down while uh, this is the spouse who's really in the limelight in all of that 10th house energy, uh, which would really take on a Uranian kind of unpredictable theme, especially in this spiritual space. Um, Oh, that would be interesting. It would be very interesting because Sagittarius and Pisces ruled by Jupiter, both in that spiritual dynamic. It wouldn't surprise me if Ziva uh, had a relationship with somebody who was intensely spiritual, but also wove spirituality into what they do. Um, yes, but in a very unpredictable and Uranian way. And that's really what we need to move for forward in the chart is understanding that yes, the family is what grounds the relationship, but supporting somebody else's process towards success and being that being that person who is able to adore and appreciate, but also stand behind the curtain with the children saying, look, there's, there's your other, there's your other parent. There's look, look what you can do. Let me, let me as the, as the maternal archetype figure out a way to show you what you're capable of. The best way to show you what you are capable of is to uh, marry a spouse who is very, very successful and give you that example to strive for so that you know that if you shoot for the moon, you're going to catch a few stars. And that's that's a big part of, of Ziva's chart as well. Um, yeah, and then you could totally have a side business, Siva, because we've got that Sun in Scorpio in the sixth, ruling that Mars in Cancer in the second. Um, wouldn't necessarily make a, a, a lot of money from it, but you having a side hustle will also give you that give you that sense of purpose that will spice up um, the other aspects of your chart. Cool. <laughs> yes, rich husbands. <laughs> um, hey, everybody. Hey, Ash. Uh, hey, Brother Lightheart. Hey, everybody who's jumping on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we are just about halfway through our for through our forecast. I keep saying forecast. Um, through our chart interpretations. Let's talk about Ike. Ike, Gemini in the chart uh, this morning. I uh, was not prepared for all this Gemini. Um, so let's talk about Gemini. We have uh, Ike's Ascendant in Gemini as well as South Node in Gemini. This is an interesting dynamic for sure. How do I feel about that? Um, not really too sure how I feel about that, to be honest. We've got some conflicting information here. 
So we have we have some really interesting dynamics in, in Ike's chart, which I think are going to be just a little bit confusing. The first is the first is the the north node south node axis being in the first house of self and the seventh house of relationships. So one of the things that Ike has promised has and this is something that I talk to my clients a lot about is the natal chart. The natal chart is a promise. The snapshot of the sky at the time that you were born indicates the promise of your incarnation is a good way to think about it, right? So the south node represents in the chart where we've been. The north node represents where we are going, our, our achievement, where we are striving towards this go around. Um, and the north node is in the seventh house of relationships. Um, and that seventh house of relationships, having the north node really talks about uh, a relationship with another person being the priority. So throughout Ike's life, one of the things that will constantly be in the back of the head is, why aren't you with someone? Um, and that's that's just something to be aware of. But those relationships will also be a, a forging point, um, a not easy point for Ike, but those relationships will be crucial to forge the personality traits that we are going to talk about um next so just just something to understand ike's obsession with relationships is actually good it's part of it's part of the life goal um but the relationships that ike chooses will not be helpful and they are and this is something that i think it it sucks with astrology because trying to explain that to a client is like well what do you mean my relationships aren't going to be helpful i'm saying honey that you chose to have poor relationships because it helps you grow. And growth is the priority this time around. They're like, but I want, I want my rich husband. Um, and I say, well, honey, not everybody gets a rich husband. And in fact, your life contract specifically states in your natal chart that the, the worse off your life partner is, the better you will be because the more you will grow. And that is just tough shit. Yeah, not an easy life lesson to understand, not a life lesson that's easy to communicate as an astrologer, but it's definitely an interesting perspective point when people say, oh, I want all these ideal relationships. I want all of these ideal things. I want all of this ideal life. Where, where are your struggles going to be? Struggles are what help you grow. So when it comes to Ike's chart specifically, the struggle is going to be in the seventh house of relationships, but those struggles will specifically help foster the strengths that we're going to talk about now. The strengths in Ike's chart are actually really fascinating. We've got Sun in Leo in a Kazemi with the Sun uh, in Leo and Mercury in Leo retrograde in the third house of writing, teaching, communication. Um, this is something that Ike will actually be very, very good at. Um, when we look at Ike's chart as well, we have a full moon in Aquarius. So the moon is opposing the sun via the ninth house. And we also have Neptune in Aquarius in the ninth house, as well as the MC. This is college professor stuff in Ike's chart. This is English professor stuff in Ike's chart. This is a love and infatuation with the English language. Uh, also, poetry, great way to access relationship potential, which is something that Ike's going to try probably around middle school, high school, when he starts really being able to read the poets. This is going to be when, when Ike starts to use poetry as a relationship kind of hook. I find that really funny. But this Sun and Leo, very flamboyant personality, especially in that third house of writing, teaching, communication, Venus and Leo being here in Kazemi, there is a sense of charisma. There's, there's an oozing of charisma that Ike has, which again, gets him in trouble. Um, but at the same time, we have Mercury and Leo retrograde. So the words that come out of Ike's mouth, although they are full of charisma, they're not always accurate and they need to be refined, which brings us to studying the English language in college, being an English major, being a writing major, you know, uh, working with fiction, working with nonfiction, working with anything where we're doing word stuff, teaching stuff, writing stuff in that ninth house of higher education travel foreigners. We have the moon in Aquarius, which gives a zany and slightly aloof nature to, to Ike's emotions, which I'm not really a fan of because he's already so charismatic. The worst thing that he could possibly do is not care about his impact on other people. However, that's a thing. He doesn't recognize the repercussion of his actions. He's an actor without the empathy is a good way to say it. Um, but 
his flamboyant expression is very, very powerful, and the words that he chooses are very, very correct. Um, it's just they're going to come across in a way that seems very aloof and and unempathetic, which is which is somewhat true. And I think the way that we refine that, that we hone that, is by sticking him into the scholastic setting, by really getting him to pursue higher learning, by really getting him to uh, understand that choosing a craft that can be honed over time, yeah, especially with this Saturn and Libra in the fifth, making an exact trying to the moon at 13 degrees, super fan of that. Um, absolutely lovely. The idea of Ike becoming the forge master and wordsmith of the English language, something I would totally 100% back. Um, and I would take his classes because he obviously will know his stuff. Um, however, this is something that will need to be accrued over time. Um, thank you everybody for the messages as my phone is buzzing. Um, but yes, that's that's a thing. Uh, we will need to watch out for Ike's finances. Not not really a fan of the finance stuff. Um, we'll get much better halfway through the life, but we have this this Mars and Cancer in the second being ruled by the moon in the ninth. So college is probably gonna drain a lot of funds. It's not necessarily going to be super productive for the first half of life. However, again, if Ike works hard and really starts to put um, the hours in to, to build this reputation, to build this strength, to build this acquisition of knowledge and effort, then the universe will reward him with excellent financial finances. But ideally we would need to get a CPA on that because that's not an ideal financial placement. Cool. Good stuff. Yes, he's into poetry. Yes, thank you. Oh, I love it. I'm so excited to see that, Ash, for sure. I am i can't wait. Follow up with me, please. Okay. Um, good morning, Vicky. Good morning, everybody who's jumping on. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're halfway through the chart. So now it's time for my shameless plug. Um, if you would like to support my work, I do accept PayPal donations via Sam at ScorpioRisingAstrology.com. Or if you would like to schedule a private consult or take an online class, which are only like 25 bucks, um, you can always go to www.ScorpioRisingAstrology.com. Check out my video on TikTok. Uh, videos on TikTok, check out my stories, leave comments, share the work, um, spread the joy that is looking at the stars, and you will continue to keep me in business and my bills paid. Thank you very much. Okay, now let's look at Kelly's chart. Kelly, my darling, 8.30 a.m. in Cambridge. Ooh, we've got a Scorpio ascendant. Ooh, we've got Uranus and Scorpio on the ascendant. Ooh, girl, okay. Ooh, and Sun and Libra in the 12th. Mm. Oh, good. Okay, child, listen here. So we've got a Scorpio ascendant. I know that you're supposedly a Libra. That is not the case. We've got a Scorpio, well, it is the case, but it's not the case, hear me out. Um, we've, got this, we've got this Scorpio ascendant, which is where all of that, all of that attachment to um, the dark, the Gothic, the psychological, the interested and interesting the deeper layer of society really really comes forward in your chart you've also put that outer planet of uranus and scorpio in the first house making all of that um scorpio energy very mischievous somewhat deviant especially early in the life but it's all because of the self-esteem issues that you lack so although i would really say bravo uranus and scorpio in the in the first house i think that it actually compounds a lot of your um insecurities which we need to definitely 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 talk about um being extrovert being an extroverted introvert is not necessarily a skill that is valuable unless you know why that is and how to work with it for that we need to understand why you've chosen to put your self-esteem at such a low place. So we have North Node, Sun, Pluto, and Mercury all in Libra and all in the 12th house of hidden enemies. This is a social justice warrior complex. Uh, this is where you as somebody who is obsessed with the notion of fair uh, is seeking a, seeking a world, seeking a life where people are no longer uh, victimized, yeah, because you yourself feel victimized, although you are the victim, most cases, Kelly. That's the truth. Um, when we look at 
When we look at Kelly's chart in terms of the, the social justice warrior complex of the 12th house, I really enjoy that placement because I think it will fuel a lot of the self-development, self-growth. But in order to help other people, Kelly, you have to kind of cast yourself down into the pit. And this is something that we see with all major stories, the hero, the hero of a thousand faces. Yeah, there is a there is a there is a disowning, there is a exiling, there is a cast outness. Like let's look at Lucifer as an example. Lucifer, the morning star, cast out of heaven, greatest comeback story ever. Um, so when we look at that, it's like you've chosen to put these placements in in your own personal hell. Like all of your power placements are in this this 12th house of hidden enemies where it's like, how, are, how am I ever going to access this sense of self and this sense of power? Well, that's something for you to discover throughout the life. Um, and it will get easier the older that you get, but we can't just rely on that zany uh, Uranus and Scorpio in the first. We have to actually dig deep and do the work. Um, and I think that this is why you've attracted the friend groups that you attract. We have this Venus and Virgo, uh, in the 11th house, which we've already talked about in the podcast, this Venus and Virgo being that very buttoned up, uh, fifties housewife version of Venus, who is a little bit too pristine, a little bit too clean, uh, and not, not as offering of authentic love as we would like a little bit more of a robotic Venus. And so you you attract these friends who love you, but who are also trying to poke you and prod you and help you and organize you and get you to try to work on yourself, which you desperately need. So don't don't blame them. Don't don't point the finger at them when they're really just trying to help, uh, because although their words are harsh, their words are accurate. Something to be frighteningly aware of. As we progress through the chart. I think we have this this moon in Leo, uh, MC and Saturn in Leo up in the 10th house of success as well. This attachment to fame, like the minute that you get into a spotlight, it's going to immediately shed light on all of the areas that you find hidden. That's the easy way to, to get that attention. And it is very, very... Um, yeah, it's just easy. It's an easy way for you to step on a stage, for you to be in front of a large group of people and to say, look at me. Yeah, because then all of your flaws are exposed for you and you don't necessarily need to do the darker shadow work, the internal excavations that we would need you to do uh, outside of the public eye. So that's that's one cheat. Yeah, but at the same time, it's not really where the work needs to be. The work needs to be in this 12th house of karmic healing, of hospitalizations, of uh, jails, asylums, um, hidden enemies. We really need to work with, with that space in your chart to help rectify and honor some of the struggles that you've imposed upon yourself. Um, we also have connections in this chart between the ninth and the Second, so money being drained because of scholastic stuff, very, very common, um, but also potential for uh, teaching in university, earning money from higher education work. We do have Jupiter in Cancer, as well as Mars in Cancer in the ninth. So there's a love-hate relationship with school, um, especially on the higher levels. There is this Jupiter in Cancer trait where it's the benevolent overlord, um, but then there is also this Mars in Cancer, this... this um, this warrior trudging through the swamps. And so we have this, this kind of give and take back and forth of this Jupiter and Cancer, Mars and Cancer. And I think that if we were to actually work in the scholastic setting, it might be a little bit hard, but if we were to teach in a scholastic setting, uh, it would be much, much easier. So although we might need to trudge through the, the swamps of being of working at a college, working at a higher education facility where there's going to be a lot of friction, there's going to be a lot of tension. We have this natural this natural platform to be like, oh, hey, I just got my degree. Do you have a teaching job open? And somebody's gonna be like, yes. And then the minute that you get in front of the class, you're going to not only be helping people uh, via that social justice warrior tendency of the 12th, but you're also gonna be on the spotlight, which will trigger all of your self work as well. Not going to be easy, but it is what needs to be done. Thank you, Kelly, for your chart. I appreciate you. Okay. 
So that's fun. We have um, three more. Let's talk about Mike, baby. Uh, so we've got 6 a.m. in Augusta. Mike, my darling, my, my Sasquatch, love ya. Um, so we have, oh, that's interesting. Well, that's where the reporter thing comes in. So we've got, we've got the ascendant 21 degrees cancer, Mercury in cancer stationed, ooh, um, and the sun at 29 degrees cancer, right on the cusp. You're a hair away from being a Leo so close to being a leo in fact when when a client comes forward and we we look at a sun that's right on that cusp i would read them as both a cancer and a leo for sure so when we look at this when we look at this pile up in the first house we have a very quick mind but a mind that's always very cancerian about i must protect the ones i love i must care for the ones that i love and as i say that a love bug literally just lands on the window so that's a sign um and when we look at that ascendant in cancer and that sun in cancer, that double cancer tendency, it's this just this oozy, lovey dovey, protective, feel good nature that comes through in Mike's chart. It's it's really it's really quite glorious to have somebody in your life as a double cancer because they're very catering. They're very loving. They're very affectionate, um, but they do on occasion put the mother in smother. Regardless of gender, they do tend to be very um, overbearing with their love because that's what they do. Um, acts of service, very big thing for Mike. Um, but interestingly enough, because we have the son in the first and potentially the second, uh, if we were to move you just a couple minutes with Leo, uh, there is an attachment to the chart with finance. Um, there's a lot of earning money through personality. There's a lot of attachment to wealth and practical things, which a lot of people don't understand this about cancer. Cancer is one of the most financially prudent signs of the zodiac. We are all about saving. We are all about hoarding. We are all about providing. We are all about taking those, those coins and putting them onto our shell. Uh, to make sure that we can save them for a rainy day. And that's definitely something about Mike's chart is that financial prudence and very, very important as well because we have the North Node here, learning how to earn money via personality to be an influencer of sorts, definitely something that Mike, um, that Mike's face should be on, on that uh, stuff. But we have Mercury and Cancer ruling the third house of writing, teaching, communication. So we know that there's going to be this writing, teaching, communication stint to Mike's chart. We have Jupiter in Virgo here, Saturn in Virgo here, two of the most powerful personal planets in the third house of uh, writing, teaching, communication. So there's this really strong ability to write, teach, communicate, both in a expressive role and also in a withdrawn role. So the idea of making things that are very big and flashy and dramatic and things that people see a lot of, but also this Saturn in Virgo where we sit behind that editing desk and just scroll, 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 cut, 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 the minutia of it, very, very present in, in Mike's chart with that communication style. Oh, oh. Mike, we've got a secret. We've got a secret. Um, so when we look at Mike's charts, Mike's chart, one of the things that we need to be aware of is we have this double cancer tendency in the first house, but we also have the moon, the other, the third personal planet that really dictates personality in Scorpio in the fifth. Uh, very, very close to Uranus in Scorpio retrograde in the fifth. There is not just this creative edge, but I think this is where we really have this attachment to attachment to children and parenting. Um, secretly, one of the things that Mike really, really wants is to have a family um, and to not just have a family, but also have a family and all of the dysfunction that comes with a family. Um, that's one of the ways to get to Mike's heartstrings is to access that fifth house of children and parenting. Um, but also we have the fifth house representing sexuality. There's this Scorpio tendency here with Uranus. There's a lot of kinky shit going on in the fifth house. Um, but because that Mars and Libra is in the fourth, uh, ruling the fifth, we have this really interesting dynamic of wanting to play house, but also wanting to have secrets within the house. Likewise, that's something that Mike probably grew up with. And this is something that I like to talk with clients about as well, is there's 
the fourth house which represents our desire for family but also the family that we grew up with they're just different octaves of the experience uh growing up mike had a family that had a lot of secrets yeah um we have this pluto and libra in the fourth like massive secrets they also were there was some misplaced aggression yeah there was a lot of indecision in the family dynamic because we have this mars and libra the sign of indecision um but also mars in its fall uh, in a not great sign. But then also when we look at the higher expression of this, you know, one of the things that Mike really wants to do is lay back on the couch and say, what do you want to do today? Yeah. Um, of all the people that I have gathered in my domain that I have born into the world that I have chosen to spend my time with, which is very, very precious because that second house also deals with time as a resource. Um, what, what is it that you would like to do? What are the options of the day? and to to spend time with people based on those options based on those decisions um it's a very simple ask but to to take the secrets and to take the misplaced um misplaced anger and slight indecision of the of the family dynamic growing up and then to elevate that into yeah you know the home is a private place you know i have to keep my family safe and and cuddled but also have my own secrets in the home these things that are mine that nobody else gets to touch i also want to open it up to the floor of my family and just be like yeah so what do y'all want to do today it 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 scratches an itch that's so deep in mike that is so um that is so present it really just is at the core of the being already let's see what else do we want to talk about in the chart uh, fame in the family uh, with the fourth house Mars ruling the tenth. Oh, that Venus! Oh, that Venus! Yeah, we got to talk about that before we before we log off. So we've got Venus and Gemini in the twelfth, uh, Neptune and Sagittarius retrograde in the sixth. Uh, we do have blood sugar issues that we need to be aware of with Mike. That's going to be a really big thing because. Three, three planetary placements in the first house in Cancer rule the stomach. So what's ingested, very, very important. But then the sixth house with that Neptune uh, in Sagittarius, we need to be very aware of the pancreas, very aware of the liver. Um, make sure that any, any symptoms with liver stuff um, uh, jaundice color of the skin, uh, blood sugar crashes, that's going to be a sign that health issues are on the way, just as an FYI. Then finally, what we're going to notice uh, as a last, like just before hospital stuff is swelling of the extremities, specifically in the fingers, um, that, that swollen knobby arthritis in the hands uh, is going to be the key giveaway for Mike's health issues that they've reached a critical mass. Cool. That's that. Thanks, Mike. You're the best. Um, cool. We have conversations. We have conversations going. Um, I will. Yes, I will. I will post those links. Thank you, everybody, for jumping on. If you would like to, um, yeah, I'll post the links in the in the comments. Don't worry about it. We have two more, two more, uh, two more charts that we need to get through for the hour. So let's talk about Catherine. Catherine was born 12 p.m. in Glasgow. Uh, we've got a Scorpio ascendant, woo woo. Uh, oh, Scorpio ascendant with Neptune and Scorpio and Mars and Scorpio in the first. That's some intense energy, Catherine. I'm not necessarily a fan of that. Um, and neither were probably a lot of people growing up uh, because that Mars and Scorpio can be very, very intense, very, very passive aggressive, very, very ninja-y, um, especially with that Neptune and Scorpio. You know, there, there's this tendency for you to just craft this entire fantasy world uh, that you live in, which, you know, when you're operating through a fantasy world, it's very difficult to make uh, to make people understand where you're coming from or why. Um, and when you get upset, it, it's also very difficult to understand, again, where you come from and why, because you're upset about things that um, other people aren't perceiving uh, because you've created this, in some ways, this delusion, this veil that you've thrown over yourself um, especially in earlier years. So this this sense of toxic positivity, this sense of um, uh, or toxic negativity, because that Mars and Scorpio is just as prone to the dark side as it is the light. But those those extremes of fantasy, of pulling the wool over your own eyes, something that we need to just be very aware of uh, in the charts. Because one of the things that 
a lot of people struggle with with Scorpio rising is the feelings in the chart are not even known to themselves. Yeah. Ooh, throwing that out there for all of you Scorpio ascendants. Um, if you if you have Scorpio rising, there is a very, very real chance that, you know, people are like, you know, I, I can't get a read on you. It seems like you're hiding stuff from me all the time. Well, jump in line because you're hiding stuff from yourself first. Just as an FYI. And we also have the sun in Libra in the 12th house of of hidden enemies. So we've we've got this self-esteem stuff um that's that's really really present and it's it's sad because you've got this venus in libra this beauty this this radiance that comes out um on on the brink of death you know that really when you access all those hidden parts there's this goddess venusian energy that would like to come forward from a karmic healing perspective and you just you don't allow that forward because you're not willing to get through the muck in order to get to the the um the pearl, you know, the 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 roots of of that, which are very very enchanted, for real. Um, so I would highly recommend that you work with goddess archetypes that would be like Mutt, um, like uh, who would be some other ones, some some goddesses of of balance, um, goddesses of balance and radiance. Uh, Mother Mary would be a good one. Uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, Lakshmi potentially might be another one. Um, Hathor would be another one. Isis would be another one. Um, but just those goddess archetypes that I think are waiting for you in your 12th house to start your healing process to reclaim some of your your true radiance as opposed to just living through the fantasy. That's um, that's something that we need to be very aware of in the chart. And the fantasy is fueled by this, this fifth house Pisces. Um, you know, when it comes to your heart space, your heart space is tapped very much for for children, parents, uh, creativity, sexuality. There's a lot of really mushy tenderness in the chart too, um, but that mushy tenderness needs to be excavated and put to use. And one of the ways that you've chosen to put it to use is through by caring for others. Uh, this Jupiter and Aries retrograde in the sixth, it's tough work, it's hard work. It's not easy on the personality, somewhat compromising as well to the self, but the work that you choose to do will also help you to unlock these moments of divine radiance that come from deep, deep, deep within the subconscious. And I think that that's something that really is is beautiful about your chart is you've put these layers of, these layers of delusion and hiddenness but underneath it all, there is this like very genuine, very beautiful, very caring and lovely and divine self uh, that you access through your work. But often the hard work, the hard work is what's supposed to be scraping away all of the grossness. Um, so it's it's that that crux of life where in order to be who you are, you need to let life work on you. You need to let the roughness of life kind of uh, sand away all of the bits that are stopping you from from shining. And that's very much what we see in your chart for sure. And part of that is you couldn't run away from family fast enough, like that that Saturn and Aquarius retrograde in, in the chart, you might have stayed around way longer than you should have, meanwhile feeling totally detached from parents. Um, not, not pleasant at all, um, but the fantasy world is a coping mechanism for that. We just need to make sure that we understand that it was a coping mechanism. It did help at a certain point, but it is not who you are nor sh nor who you should be. Yes. Um, what else? We have this really interesting Virgo pile up in the eleventh house of finance. So I think one of the one of the saving graces that you haven't considered is your friendships. Um, because we've got this Mercury in Virgo, the sign of its exaltation with uh, the Midheaven very, very close to it, Uranus and Pluto in Virgo in the 11th. I think friends are gonna play a much more important role than you give them credit for. If you have a handful of like five really, really close people that you can hang out with, that you drive with, who can point out your flaws, who can call you on your shit, but simultaneously lifting, up when, lifting you up when you have a bad time, that's going to really uh, support this damaged sun in the 12th. And also they're going to be able to help you fast track that process of recognizing, hey, it's supposed to be tough because you got stuff to work on, but we love you anyway. Uh, that kind of that kind of process. And everything really just piles back into that. So I think we've I think we've covered the big parts of the chart for sure.
Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate you donating, no, donating your chart to science. Um, uh, no, I cannot speak Italian or Spanish, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, I'm working on Japanese. And then once I finish the Asian languages, I'll, I'll probably go to, to Spanish. But um, last chart, we need to talk about Lisa. Lisa, my darling, born at 444. What a magnificent time. Uh, and Dallas. We have a Leo ascendant with the south node. Oh, and it's opposing the sun and Aquarius in the seventh. Oh, goodness, girl, you're killing me. Ba, 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 air drums. So we've got this, we've got this ascendant in Leo. So we've got this, this natural flamboyant personality, which others tend to bring out in you for sure. However, this flamboyant personality does have the south node attached to it, so it is very draining to you. It's not something that you like to put on. It's a mask that you would prefer not to wear, and I get that. I get it. Um, but you've been you've you've convinced yourself, especially early on, that the more dramatic you are, the more flamboyant you are, uh, the more um, the more expressive you are, the more you embody those traits of Leo in your chart, Lisa. Um, the better you'll be, and the more you'll attract a mate. Because we have the ruler of your chart, the sun in Aquarius, the sign of its fall um, in the seventh house of relationships. I think that this is where the personality detriment really comes forward is we have this sun who would like to be expressive, but can't because it's in the coldest time of the year. And it's in the, the relationship house, which is taking away from your natural personality. But there is a good thing about this, Lisa, for sure, because you know that draining feeling where you're like, I just, I wish I didn't have to be on all the time. Good news is you don't because the people who actually love you don't want you to be on all the time. Catch 22, imagine that. Um, so finding a partner who's really going to not necessarily care as much um, about who you are, what you look like. Um, they just, they want you around because they enjoy you. They're not attached to this show, this performance that you keep getting others. And one of the big things that you're going to notice with partners, Lisa, is that intellectual connection. First and foremost, there will be almost a telepathic level of words exchanging between you and them. And I think that that's a really beautiful place for any partnership to be, but because that Mercury, uh, is right there, uh, in Aquarius as well. And the North node in the seventh house of self or uh, of relationships, we have this, this beautiful um, connection with the partnership that's, that's gonna be really great. Okay, we've got the moon in Sag and Neptune in Sag in the fifth house of children, parenting, uh, sexuality, and creativity. This is a very creative placement, Lisa. I don't know if you know this, or if you have worked in this, you'd be a great, uh, you do great in the art and the fashion world, for sure. You've got an eye for it. You've got an intuitive knowing of the fashion space. You have design chops, uh, is a good way to say it. I think you, you really um, understand the value of pieces of art, um, and you're able to incorporate those into a very prosperous work dynamic. Uh, something that you would potentially actually be very, very famous for, because that Jupiter in Capricorn is being ruled by Saturn and Taurus up in the 10th. Um, and this all comes from your Venus at 29 degrees in the eighth house of estates, taxes, uh, business, and um, and death. So one of the things that I think you'd be super, super good at, I love to throw out these like really, really extreme examples of these scenarios for clients. You'd be really good as an appraiser as somebody who walks into like a mansion of somebody who recently died and catalog catalogs, categorizes, and um, sells all of these pieces, all of this art. You'd be a great art inspector where you are able to look at old pieces of art um, or commissioned pieces of art and tell whether or not they're fakes. Um, you'd be a really good like anything fashion, art, creativity oriented, you walking in and being like, I know exactly what this is worth. Yep, that's it. And that's also how you're going to meet your husband is through the the work stuff um, via the finance. And husband, uh, husband, I say husband, sorry, um, not necessarily husband, but partner, partner. We are gender neutral here on this 
on this um, on this live stream. There is no construct of gender uh, when it comes to astrology, except for basic aspects of yin yang, masculine, feminine, um, which are not attached to genitals in any way, shape, or form. So when we look at that Mercury and Aquarius ruling the second house of finance, I think there's going to be a really good chance that the spouse that you telepathically connect with is also going to be very wealthy. Um, do, do, do. But again, like you're going to be establishing your own wealth because we've got this really cool connection between the fifth house of creativity, eighth house of estates, and tenth house of success. I really enjoy those placements. I think that's super fun. Uh, do, do, do. Let's see. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Um, no, I think that's pretty much about it. So driven to learn. We've got this Mars and Aries attached to the midheaven. No, I think that's it. I'm feeling an end to the stream. Uh, but thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you donating your chart. Um, and that is all that I have for today. So um, thank you, everybody, for jumping on to the live stream. I appreciate you very, very much. Um, wouldn't be able to do it without you. If you'd like to support my work, uh, feel free to PayPal me, sam at scorpiorisingastrology.com, or buy a class. I have classes for 25 bucks on my website, online classes on astrology. Uh, Herbalism, Energetics, Interpreting Your Moon at ScorpioRisingAstrology.com. If you'd like to book a consult, you can go to ScorpioRisingAstrology.com, click Consultations, and you'll see the form uh, to request a session with me. But yeah, I'll also post the video for YouTube. Um, the YouTube channel has all of the previous live streams, and I'll post that once the video is done buffering. Um, but in the meantime, may the stars be ever in your favor. <laughs>